everybody. Welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive. Today we are picking up with the case of Lucy Letby, a young NICU nurse who's been accused of murdering seven infants and attempting to murder 10 more. And according to the prosecution, Lucy did this by rotating between three different methods. She would either inject air into the baby's bloodstream, causing an air embolus, or she would poison the baby with insulin, or she would overfeed the baby. The Countess of Chester Hospital in Manchester in the UK, where Lucy worked, began to notice the uptick in sudden infant collapses and death, and so they began an internal investigation, which led them to believe that someone on the inside was was purposely hurting these babies, that this was no accident, and that's when they called in the police. Lucy Letby was eventually arrested, but she has pleaded not guilty to all of her charges, and her lawyer has presented us with the idea that Lucy is simply a devoted nurse who happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, and the real culprit is the hospital, the hospital that wasn't equipped to care for newborns with complications at birth. Now, if you haven't seen part one of this series, I've linked it in the description box. You should watch that first because we went over a lot of context. We also went through the first six charges, each corresponding with a different child, and each child was given a letter, A through F, so that they could be spoken about in court without compromising the privacy of that child or its parents. Now, I do want to apologize ahead of time for my voice. You may not be able to tell a difference. You may be able to tell a difference. I can because my head is all stuffy. I just came down with something and I'm congested and my head is stuffy and my ears are like plugged. And I, e I even hate saying that I'm sick because then there's always like a handful of people in the comments who are like, it seems like you're always sick. Like, what is that? What are you suggesting? It seems like I'm always sick. Do I have young children? Yes. Do I have a compromised immune system? Yes. That's always going to equal like constantly being sick until my kids aren't school age anymore. So it's not like I'm over here just like <laughs> purposely being sick to annoy you. <laughs> but I am coming down with something. And because of that, I feel like I sound different. I sound different to myself, but everything sounds different to me right now. So bear with me. Um, and uh, hopefully I don't sound as bad to you as I do to myself. But before we dive into today's video, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. Just like there are advancements in technology and DNA, all of those hackers out there, they are upping their game as well. And it's not only these like nefarious figures lurking in the dark crevices of the internet that you have to worry about. You also have to worry about your own internet service provider possibly the biggest crook of them all, selling your personal data without your consent or without your knowledge half of the time. But at least I know I can be safe on the internet with Surfshark VPN. And here's the cool part. So can you. Surfshark VPN secures your data with industry-leading measures by using uncrackable encryption and the most secure VPN protocols. And when I say data, I mean, well, a lot of things. A lot of, a lot of things fall under data sensitive information like credit card and banking numbers, your private information like text messages, emails, those photos and videos you might have on that phone of yours. I'm not judging. I'm just saying they're there and you probably don't want anybody else to see them. And there's a ton of other stuff you're doing on the internet that you might think like, I don't care if anybody sees what I'm doing. What does it matter if somebody's watching me shop for a pair of yellow rain boots? But it does matter, right? Because this is the stuff that makes you valuable as a consumer. The things you're searching for on the internet, what you're doing on social media, who you're talking to on social media, the devices you're using to access the internet, your internet service provider can see all of that. And they sell it to the highest bidder so that companies can target you more accurately. And if target feels like an aggressive word, it's because it is. You're being profiled. And honestly, I don't want anyone making money off of me, not unless I'm getting a big cut. So your ISP, your internet service provider, can also slow down your internet connection if they think you're using too much data. And this, I swear to God, this happened to me so much back in the day before I used Surfshark VPN. And it was incredibly disruptive to my workday because I'm always online for work. I need a fast internet service for you know research, going from page to page, uploading videos. But I also have kids who are like Wi-Fi hogs. You know, they like to game on their tablets. They like to game on their 
their PCs. They like to game on their gaming systems. And all of that uses a ton of data, and my internet service provider was always slowing us down, and I always seem to be the one to pay for it. Surfshark VPN encrypts your internet traffic, so even your ISP can't see what you're doing. Surfshark also provides IP and DNS leak protection so that nobody can find out where you're connecting from, and they maintain a strict no-logs policy, which means they never store or save what you're doing on the internet. And a lot of internet providers do that because... They want to sell your data. We've already talked about this. And all of this might sound complicated to you, and you might think, you know, I'm not tech savvy enough to even understand how to do this or know where to start. And that is how I felt. I feel that way about everything because I'm not tech savvy enough for anything, really. It takes me way too long to learn things. But Surfshark is so easy to use. And if I can say that, trust me, you know it's true. You just have to install it and run it, and then Surfshark will connect to the server that offers you the best speed by default. And Surfshark VPN is jam-packed with features that go way beyond the basics. And these features allow you to not only protect yourself and your personal information, which we've already talked about, which is super important, But there's a ton of other fun benefits, like having access to entertainment that you might not otherwise have. I don't know if you guys know this about me, but I love British television. I love all the British shows, Ripper Street, Being Human, The British Version, even Coronation Street, which funnily enough, we're going to talk about in this episode. I love it all, and with Surfshark VPN, I don't have to wait for new seasons of my favorite BBC shows to come to the U.S. I can watch them as soon as they're playing over the pond. By simply changing my IP address to a different country, I can instantly gain access to that country's massive content library. With Surfshark VPN, you can also unlock 15 of the largest Netflix country libraries, including the U.S. and Japan, and Surfshark has now reached coverage in 100 countries, which is huge. Best of all, and I think my favorite feature of Surfshark VPN is that one subscription allows you to install and run Surfshark on an unlimited number of devices. That's huge for me because it saves money. And I want to see my kids and my loved ones and, you know, my family protected. So my parents can use it. My husband can use it. All my kids can use it on their tablets, on their computers, on their PS5s, on their Xboxes, on their phones, all of it. So you have nothing to lose. You should definitely try Surfshark VPN for yourself. If you find it's not for you, they do offer a 30-day money-back guarantee, which gives you plenty of time to try Surfshark out risk-free. And right now, for a limited time, you can get 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months for free. All you have to do is go to surfshark.deal slash Stephanie Harlow. This special offer makes your subscription just $2.21 a month so you can browse securely on all of your devices. Once again, go to surfshark.deal slash Stephanie Harlow for 83% off a two-year plan plus three extra months for free. Thank you so much to Surfshark for sponsoring today's video, and let's dive in. Okay, so today we will start with Baby G. And Baby G is unique in two ways. One, she was the most premature baby in this case, weighing just one pound and two ounces at birth. And two, Lucy Letby is accused of attempting to take this baby girl's life on three separate occasions. And that's why Baby G is included in three separate counts of attempted murder that have been leveled at Lucy. Baby G was born at the end of May 2015, and in our timeline, that actually puts her birth before any of the other babies were attacked or died. But because Baby G was so small and premature, and it's sad because Baby G's mother, who gave birth when she was only 23 weeks pregnant, she had actually struggled to get pregnant, and she'd gone through multiple rounds of IVF. And it's just because Baby G was so small, it it took her a little bit longer to like go through the different rooms, the different nurseries at the hospital. And at birth, Baby G was described as being in a poor condition, and she needed to be put on ventilators to help her breathe. And this meant that her mother was unable to hold her for the first seven weeks of Baby G's life. And doctors had given her only a 5% chance of survival. Now, Baby G was actually born at a different hospital. And while there, she suffered from a myriad of health issues, including jaundice, high blood sugar, kidney and bowel issues, multiple infections, chronic lung disease, and she also had a bleed on one of her lungs. And during the trial, it was said that Doctors told the parents of Baby G at least five times in those early days after birth 
that their child wasn't going to make it. But apparently, this tiny, teeny little baby, this baby that could fit in the palm of your hand, she was a fighter. She was tough, and she pulled through. By the time she was 13 weeks old, she weighed four pounds, and she was no longer on a ventilator, although she was still receiving oxygen through her nose, which is very common for uh, premature babies. And she was eating her mother's expressed breast milk every three hours without any issues. And this was a huge improvement, and this baby had come a long way from having only a 5% chance of survival to really thriving and, you know, doing very, very well by the time she was 13 weeks old. Now, the doctors at the hospital she was born at decided that baby G was doing well enough to be transferred to the Countess of Chester Hospital, which was closer to where her parents lived. And this happened on the evening of August 13th. And the fact that, that this baby was born in May and didn't arrive at the Countess of Chester Hospital until August means there's several months of of her being, you know, alive, getting better, improving, doing well before she even arrives at the hospital where Lucy Letby works, which is why on our timeline, baby G is born before baby A, B, C, D, E, and F. But I also want to point out this baby was very, very, very sick at birth at this different hospital. I think it was Liverpool Women's Hospital. This baby was very, very sick at birth. 5% chance of survival, weighed under two pounds, fit in the palm of your hand. The father said, this baby fit in the palm of my hand. A hole in her lung, all of these other issues, kidney and liver and bowel and infections and everything. And yet for, you know, several months, what, June to July, July to August, at best, two months, she survived and she didn't have collapses and she didn't get sick and nothing bad was happening to her. She was fighting. She was healing. She was getting better. She was improving. She was getting stronger. And then on August 13th, she goes to the Countess of Chester Hospital and she's placed in the HDU or the high dependency unit. Remember the ICU is the the most high level of care and then the HDU is right under that. So baby G at the time of going to Countess of Chester Hospital wasn't even at like ICU status. And baby G continued to do well and remain stable until the evening of September 6th. Now it was a time of celebration in the NICU on the evening of September 6th because the following day was to be baby G's 100th day of life. She'd been born 100 days before that. And this is like a big deal for a baby who's so premature and has such a a low chance of survival at birth. So the nurses at Countess of Chester Hospital were setting up a little celebration to mark the occasion. And part of the celebration was they were making a congratulations banner. And Lucy Letby actually helped make this congratulations banner. That night, Lucy was on the night shift, but she was not baby G's assigned nurse. She was actually taking care of a different baby that night in the ICU unit. Now, baby G's assigned nurse said that everything was well with the baby that night. The baby's vitals were stable, and at 2 a.m., the nurse administered baby G's feeding, which was her mother's expressed breast milk, through the baby's nose tube as the baby slept. And then baby G's nurse left the nursery to go on her break, which was an hour long. So no problem there, right? She feeds the baby. The baby tolerates the feed well. She sleeps through it. Everything's fine. So the nurse can now go on break. Now, the senior nurse who was the shift supervisor on the neonatal unit that night was Nurse Simpson. And she said she was Uh, at the nurse's station right across from the room that baby G was in when she suddenly heard this little baby girl vomit so loudly and violently that she ran immediately in. And then the alarm attached to baby G's vitals went off. So both she and Lucy Letby rushed into the room that baby G was in. And they began giving the baby rescue breaths when they saw that her heart rate and oxygen levels had dropped. Now in the baby's chart, it states in Lucy's handwriting that baby G vomited again and 45 milliliters of milk as well as some air were extracted from the 
baby's stomach. Now, Dr. Allison Ventress, the registrar on duty that night, she checked on the baby and decided to start a round of antibiotics. But before she could begin this, she was called away for an emergency delivery. However, an hour later, Dr. Ventress was called out of that delivery to return to the cot of baby G when the baby stopped breathing again around 3.20 in the morning. Baby G was then moved to the ICU and the on-call pediatric consultant, Dr. Stephen Breary, was summoned. Meanwhile, Dr. Allison Ventress attempted to put a tube in baby G's throat, and it was at that point that she saw what looked like blood in the baby's throat, and the source of the blood seemed to be coming from behind the baby's vocal cords. Now, according to the prosecution in this case, the trauma to the baby's throat was another trademark of Lucy Letby's attack. After baby C had died, it was discovered that he had swelling and trauma to his vocal cords. And remember, uh, baby E, when his mother had walked into the nursery to bring her breast milk, she noticed that her newborn was bleeding from his mouth, and it was discovered later that he had significant damage to his throat, which Dr. Dewey Evans testified was most likely done by using some stiff, hard, or wiry object to basically purposely cause harm to this baby's throat. Additionally, during the trial, Dr. Ventress was asked if she saw the blood during or after intubation, and she said it was during. And the reason they ask this is because intubation can sometimes cause like inflammation and even light bleeding uh, to the throat because it's like a tube, and depending on um, the f- many factors, right? I mean, I'm, I can't imagine how hard it is to intubate like a tiny, teeny little newborn baby, but there's a lot of factors. And, and sometimes it can cause trauma and inflammation. So that's why they asked, was it before or after? And she said it's during the intubation that she notices the blood. Dr. Allison Ventress was also asked if it was unusual to see that. And she replied, quote, it's not uncommon for the baby to have bleeding during intubation. It is unusual to have blood coming up from beneath the vocal cords, end quote. Now, of course, through all of this, Lucy Letby was like texting and WhatsApping her friends and colleagues, and she messaged one about Baby G's initial collapse in the early morning hours of September 8th, Baby G's 100th day of life. So Baby G collapsed on her 100th day of life. And the colleague responded to Lucy and said, quote, oh, she likes to celebrate the big ones in style, end quote. And Lucy responded by telling her work colleague, how unhealthy this baby was, saying that baby G looked like rubbish when she'd taken over her care that morning. Now, because baby G's condition had worsened, her assigned nurse was no longer qualified to take care of her, so the nurse went to alert the parents of baby G that the baby had collapsed and to let them know that the baby had been moved to the ICU and had also been moved to the care of a more qualified and trained nurse, a band six nurse, Lucy Letby. And believe it or not, a short time after going into Lucy Letby's care, the baby collapsed an additional two times, one at 5.30 a.m. and again at 6.05 a.m. And the doctors were kind of freaking out at this point because they did not know what was wrong with this baby or how to help her, right? She had been doing great at the other hospital. She'd been doing great at Countess of Chester for, you know, a time. And now all of a sudden, out of nowhere, for no obvious reason, this baby keeps crashing. She was on the ventilator, so they checked to make sure the ventilator was up and running, to make sure it was working, that there were no issues. They even changed out the ventilator for a new one to see if like that was it. Maybe they couldn't see that nothing was working, but the ventilator wasn't working maybe, so they put a new one on. Nothing worked. And then they saw mucus in the baby's breathing tube, and they noticed that baby G's abdomen, her stomach, was distended. The doctors actually located a clot in her throat. They removed it, and they drew some more air out of her stomach. Now, during the trial, two medical professionals would testify to the same thing. Dr. Dewey Evans and neonatologist Dr. Sandy Bowen, they both agreed that someone had given baby G too much milk. And this was proven by the fact that baby G's assigned nurse had fed the baby 45 milliliters of expressed breast milk around 2 a.m. Remember, she fed the baby, baby was sleeping, she fed the baby through the nasal tubes, baby slept through it, and then the nurse went on her hour break. But then while baby G's assigned nurse 
was out on break, baby G threw up after that. And a lot, according to the senior nurse on staff, who the one who was at the uh, nurse's station when this happened, she said the vomit was projectile. It was all over the inside of the baby's cot. It was all over her bedding. It was all over her. But more than that, it was outside of the baby's cot, all over the floor and even on a chair, a chair that was like a couple of feet away from the cot. So this is violent projectile vomiting. But then an additional 45 milliliters of milk along with air was removed from baby G's stomach when Lucy Latby took over. And this showed that far more milk came out of that baby than was officially put in. And this didn't happen by accident. So basically, the doctors are saying, okay, if she only was fed on record 45 milliliters of milk, then how the hell did she projectile vomit that milk up and then later projectile vomit another 45 milliliters of milk? Somebody fed that baby more than she should have been fed. Not only did someone, allegedly Lucy Letby, overfeed baby G intentionally, but they had also injected air into her stomach. After Lucy Letby left her shift that day at 10 a.m., she began to message a work friend who had taken over baby G's care. And Lucy was talking to this nurse who was taking care of the baby, and she was asking, you know, like, how are the parents doing? What's going on? How's the baby progressing? What do you think's wrong with the baby? And then the next day, the nurse who was assigned to Baby G and Lucy began messaging each other about Baby G's very bad condition. And the nurse said that the baby was even worse that day, with Lucy sending a sad face emoji and saying that the baby needed to go out. Basically, the baby needed to be transferred to a different hospital, most likely Arrow Park, where she'd been born. I'm sorry, I said Liverpool Woman's. That's a different case. So this baby, Baby G, had been born at Arrow Park, and then she'd been transferred over to Countess of Chester when she was healthy and recovered. So Lucy says, you know, this baby's got to get out of here. Like, basically, we're not qualified enough here to take care of her. And there's a lot of stuff that Lucy talks about, and we're going to go over it in this video and next, as she's talking with her friends and, you know, people she works with. And she constantly complains that there's not enough staff. And most of the staff that she works with um, on the neonatal unit, they're like not qualified. Basically, like they're useless next to her. She constantly complains about all the other people that she works with and basically says like they're not staffed properly and management sucks and there's no leadership and she's just constantly complaining. So she says the baby's got to be moved. We can't take care of her here. But the nurse on duty with baby G said, no, baby G is too sick to move. She looks horrible. She's getting puffy. So Lucy wasn't even on the schedule that day, but she still went into the hospital anyway anyways, to fill out some paperwork. And while she was there, she made a point of checking in on baby G. And then she texted her friend, the other nurse, and she said, the baby looks awful, doesn't she? She's declining bit by bit. Later that night, Baby G was transferred back to Arrow Park Hospital, where, surprisingly, her condition quickly improved after she was treated for an infection. And by September 16th, she was doing so well, she was transferred back to the Countess of Chester Hospital. But strangely enough, once back at the hospital, on Baby G's official due date, like the day that she should have been born if she hadn't been born premature or the day she was, you know, projected to be born, the infant collapsed again, which is odd. Because earlier that day, Lucy Letby had messaged her nurse friend once again asking about baby G. And the nurse friend is like, this is too good to be true. Baby G was doing so poorly. We were all afraid she wouldn't make it. And now she's back here and she's doing so well. She's in nursery four, not the NICU, not the HDU, just like a regular old nursery. It's almost too good to be true. And Lucy was like, She's not doing that well. The baby's vomiting, she's pale, and she's been cold for the last 24 hours. <laughs> and then she messages in an upbeat sort of way, due date today, you know, like I said, meaning it's the day that baby G would have been due to be born had she not been born premature. So Lucy, like, doesn't want to hear that the baby is getting better, doesn't want to hear that the baby is, like, back at Countess of Chester and whatever happened at Arrow Park, 
made her better and fixed her. And, and now she's thriving again. It seems kind of like she's like, no, she's not doing that well. What are you talking about? And Lucy goes on and she's like, it was a mistake putting um, Baby G in nursery for. Like, it was a big jump, she said, considering how poor Baby G's condition had been just the week prior. And she said, quote, being in four is bad enough and then having NN, NN stands for nursery nurses, that don't always know what to look for or act on. End quote. So Lucy's suggesting that um, the baby is too sick to be cared for in nursery for by these nursery nurses because the nursery nurses aren't good enough to take care of this baby. But Lucy is. Only Lucy is. You know, she can't have these nursery nurses getting the attention for being like the the Mother Teresa's and, and the Florence Nightingale's. It's got to always be Lucy. And in my opinion, she is a little like agitated that she's not getting attention at this point because Lucy goes on to tell her friend how happy Baby G's mother was that Lucy was taking care of her infant again. She said, quote, it's hard, isn't it? When mom came in today, she was like, oh, I'm so pleased you've got her, which I thought was a little strange as I don't know her that well, but wonder if she just felt reassured to have a nurse, end quote. And I mean, it goes on like this. Um, It goes on like this. If Lucy wasn't around baby G, she was texting whatever nurse was and asking for updates about the baby's condition and progress until September 21st when baby G collapsed again at around 10.30 a.m., vomiting twice. Her oxygen levels dropped dangerously low, her heart rate was up, and she stopped breathing for 10 full seconds. She was pale, and she had a swollen stomach, and a Dr. Peter Felding was called in to help, and it only took him a few minutes to get to baby G's cot, and by that point, the baby had improved. She'd stabilized herself. So baby G really was a fighter. But what had preceded this collapse? What could have caused it. Lucy Letby was actually working the day shift on September 21st. She'd arrived at 7.30 a.m., and she was the assigned nurse to Baby G in Nursery 4. She also had three other babies in that same room. At around 9.30 a.m., Lucy fed Baby G 45 milliliters of milk, roughly an hour before the baby became critically ill and collapsed. But at that point, the doctors weren't necessarily suspicious of Lucy Letby, although they were curious about what it caused the infant's collapse. So they started trying things out, just as they had when she'd collapsed earlier that month. They stopped feeding her milk. She was instead given IV fluids and antibiotics, and she was sent for x-rays and blood work. They were trying to figure out why, out of nowhere, this baby kept collapsing for no like identifiable reason. They were going crazy with it. And the doctors were actually struggling to insert something called a canella. And apparently that's a thin tube that doctors will insert into a person's body for the purposes of medication delivery. Oh, I think the one that they use for the babies goes in like their belly button. And while this was happening, baby G's parents and her assigned nurse all left the room. And once this canella was successfully inserted and the baby had been placed on a Massimo monitor, which is a portable device that continually measures oxygen saturation and heart rate levels, the doctors all left the room as well. And so at this point, baby G is completely alone. And within minutes, Lucy Letby, who was actually, I think, looking after babies in a separate room at that point, she began yelling for help. And she was at the side of baby G's cot. A nurse who can't be named for legal reasons said she ran into the nursery when she heard Lucy yelling for help and witnessed Lucy using a resuscitator on baby G, and the baby did not look well. The nurse said that Lucy was obviously concerned or seemed to be obviously concerned, and she was responding appropriately, but this nurse did notice that the Massimo monitor had been switched off, and this was not normal protocol, right? Because normally that monitor is hooked up to an alarm, and when the vitals drop to a certain level or below a certain level, the alarm will go off, and that notifies people who may not be in the room, who may be at the nurse's station or in a different room, that this baby in this room needs help, and then they go running in. But for some reason, this baby's Massimo monitor had been turned off, so how did Lucy know 
that the baby needed help and was crashing. Now, this nurse did say that she didn't believe Lucy had been the one to turn the monitor off. She said it was actually two doctors, um, consultant Dr. John Gibbs and registrar Dr. David Harkness, who had turned off the monitor. And she claims they apologized to her later that afternoon for not turning the monitor back on. Now, in court, Dr. Gibbs and Dr. Harkness denied remembering turning it off and and denied remembering apologizing for it. And they said, both of them said, this would have been very unusual for us to have done that. Like, we don't see a reason why we would have shut the monitor off, especially with this baby who was, you know, really like crashing and we didn't know why. And I almost wonder because the nurse, like this is just my speculation, but because this nurse specifically can't be named. And I know Lucy did have a few friends um, who were working with her and were on the day shift and stuff, like some close friends that she talked to a lot via text and WhatsApp. I wonder if this unnamed anonymous nurse is one of her friends. And this friend is kind of like, I don't know, basically saying Lucy didn't do it. It was these two doctors. And I know because they told me they did it. And these doctors like, we have no idea what you're talking about. Like, is she lying for Lucy is what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Like, I was trying to say it in a a tactful way. But is she lying for Lucy? That's what I want to know. So baby G, who's obviously, you know, very sick now, was transferred to the ICU and she was eventually discharged and allowed to go home in November of 2015. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second because it's not really a happy ending. and But that's basically why we have three counts of attempted murder for baby G because the prosecution's alleging that Lucy tried to take this baby's life three times, three separate times. And although this mini lightweight did survive, she did not emerge unscathed from the fight. The baby's father said it broke his heart because even though his daughter was premature and tiny, You know, she would always smile at him through her tubes and her IVs when he talked to her. But after her many collapses, she no longer smiled. He said it was as if she didn't even know he was there or didn't recognize his voice. When she went home, baby G weighed five pounds, but she was missing milestones. And it wasn't until she had an MRI that her parents realized she had extensive brain damage. She was diagnosed with level 5 quadriplegic cerebral palsy. She was visually impaired. She had to be treated for microcephaly, which is a condition where the head of a baby is smaller than it's supposed to be. So basically, all the stuff that happened to her in this hospital, even though she survived it, she was left, you know, basically disabled. At this point, the parents of baby G have a daughter who is alive, but they don't know how long she's going to live. No doctor can tell them what her lifespan is going to be. Um, they, They don't know. And during the trial, you know, a few doctors testified about baby G's condition and how, like, stumped they'd been when they were trying to treat her. And they specifically referred to how violently and how, like, far she had thrown up, how far she had vomited. So Dr. Stephen Brary, who was serving as the on-call consultant at the neonatal unit at the time of Baby G's collapses, he testified to the court that Baby G had been improving and she was stable. But then he got a call because the baby had, quote, very large projectile vomit that ended up on the floor and on a chair next to her crib. And he said, this was not something I had witnessed before. Dr. Dewey Evans, another medical expert who reviewed the case, for the National Crime Agency testified that such severe vomiting for a small baby was astonishing. He said, quote, for a baby to vomit that far is quite remarkable. Even more astonishing is the vomit that ends up on the chair that is several feet away. I can't recall a baby vomiting on the floor. I can't recall a baby vomiting that distance. It was described quite correctly as extraordinary, end quote. Evans then told the court that he believes the only explanation for the baby's vomiting was that she had received far more milk than the approved 1.5 ounces in her feeding tube and that such an incident can't occur accidentally. So yeah, the idea is that someone overfed her and it couldn't have really been an accident, right? Because the nurses mark every time they feed the baby, especially a baby like this, who is getting a certain amount of milk every couple of hours. So at this point, you would have seen if a nurse had accidentally fed the baby twice or if two nurses had both fed the baby once because there would have been notes made. The fact that there weren't notes made makes it definitely seem like this wasn't an accident. Somebody put more milk into this baby's feeding tube, walked away, 
until the milk went in, which is going to take some time. And then when the baby started throwing up, that someone was ready to rush in and be the hero. So we're now moving on to count 10 and count 11, where Lucy Letby is charged with the attempted murder of baby H, first on September 26th, 2015, and again on September 27th, 2015. Baby H was a premature baby girl born six weeks early via C-section with no complications, and she was healthy. However, shortly after birth, baby H looked pale and began grunting. And according to the internet, when grunting is heard in a premature baby, it means that this baby is having trouble breathing. So this baby was admitted to the ICU where she was given oxygen, IV fluids, and antibiotic. You know, just kind of like a broad spectrum treatment to cover everything. After several x-rays, it was discovered that this baby, baby H, had a tiny puncture in her lung. And the next day, the parents of baby H were called to the neonatal unit because their baby daughter had collapsed. They rushed in and found medical staff focused on attempting to resuscitate baby H. And this baby would go on to suffer from another unexplainable collapse, all while under the care of Lucy Letby. After the first collapse, which was a cardiac collapse, basically like a heart attack, baby H was successfully resuscitated, even though the medical staff could not explain what happened. Like they were able to save her, but they didn't know why she was having this cardiac arrest to begin with. Now, during the day after this, baby H was doing fine. But that night, right as the parents were headed in to bed, they were summoned to the NICU again, being told that their newborn was not responding, and once again, medical staff had to try and resuscitate her. Now, after this second unexplainable collapse, Baby H was transferred to Arrow Park Hospital on September 27th, and she improved there dramatically And quickly, like fast, as soon as she was away from Countess of Chester Hospital and Lucy Letby, she improved very, very fast. And like her her condition shot up. When they say dramatic, they mean it. Like she basically just got better because she wasn't sick to begin with at birth. You know, it wasn't like baby G where she had all of these issues. And so she's kind of already like struggling to fight that. Baby H was fine. Now, is it Lucy Letby that baby H got away from? Or is it Countess of Chester Hospital, right? That's something we have to keep in mind as we go through this. Within 24 hours of being at the other hospital, Baby H was off of her ventilator. And so they decided the next day that this baby was well enough to send back to the Countess of Chester Hospital, where she continued to do well until she was discharged in October. Now let's go over what happened. According to medical charts and doctor's records, Baby H had been admitted to the neonatal unit at 6.40 p.m. on September September 22nd, shortly after her birth. The next day, Lucy Letby sent a message to a fellow nurse, letting her know that because she had rearranged her shifts, they would be working together. In another message to her mother, we see that this shift was uh, one that Lucy had picked up. It was an extra shift. And she seemed to be doing this a lot, right? Lucy worked a lot. She would pick up extra shifts. She would work longer hours. And it was because she wanted the overtime. As we'll see, she was living in like doctor's housing. And right around this time, or maybe like in the next month, she is moving into her own place place that she has, you know, rented and it's very close to the hospital. So she's like right around the corner if anybody needs her. So she's picking up a lot of shifts. And I remember an interview with somebody, I can't remember who it was. It was somebody she worked with at the hospital, another nurse. And he said something like, yeah, I mean, she didn't have a husband. She didn't have kids. She didn't have a family. She didn't have a boyfriend. You know, like this job was her life. This was where she seemed to want to be. That day, Lucy also messaged another work friend talking about how busy the unit was expected to be that night, letting them know she thought it was completely unsafe. (laughs) You know, she thought it was completely unsafe that the unit was going to be so busy and they were understaffed. And she was mad because she would be unable to do her hula hoop exercises or catch up on Coronation Street which is a television show in the UK. It's like a very long-running television show. Lucy Letby was the assigned nurse for Baby H on the night shift of September 24th going into the morning of September 25th. At around 3 a.m. during that shift, Lucy messaged a work friend, a work colleague, asking, can I go now? And her friend and colleague responded back, yes, let's run off together and rescue blank too. And they're talking about another colleague, another friend. When Baby H crashed, Lucy Letby 
was the only one in the room with the baby. There was no other babies in that same room, no other nurses in that same room. On September 26th, after Baby H's first collapse, Lucy was chatting with a colleague, Yvonne Griffiths. And Yvonne told Lucy, you know, basically like, thank you. I notice and I see and I appreciate all the hard work that you've been putting in the last few nights. Uh, It was commendable. And Yvonne said, quote, hope you have a good sleep. I just want to commend you for all your hard work these last few nights. You composed yourself very well during a stressful situation. It's nice to see your confidence grow as you advance through your career, end quote. So there's a couple things I want to say before I move on to Lucy Letby's response. First, it seems like a lot of people ask Lucy if she got some rest, okay? Okay, it seems like a lot of people are like, get some sleep, you should rest, you need your rest, things like that. Now, is it because Lucy's working so many shifts and she's constantly there? Or is it because she's complaining about being tired or she looks tired? Who knows? But it seems like the people who are closest to her knows that she's like a little sleep deprived. Also, when Yvonne says, you know, you've handled yourself well in these stressful situations, she's talking about all of these babies collapsing, you know, and Lucy just always happens to be there, you know, seeing the bat signal in the sky before anybody else. And so she's first on hand, a first responder, if you will doing rescue breaths, is trying to save this baby and resuscitate this baby before anybody else even really knows what's happening. So Lucy responded back to Yvonne saying, quote, that's really nice to hear. As I gather, you are aware of some of the not-so-positive comments that have been made recently regarding my role, which I have found quite upsetting. Our job is a pleasure to do, and just hope I do the best for the babies and their family, end quote. Okay, so here's the tea, because this was hard to figure out. They don't have live coverage of this trial. They just have, like, updates that people tweet out. I've had to piece everything together. From what I can gather, it seemed like some of the other nurses were not super big fans of Lucy. Um, I think that she was junior compared to many of them. Now, she was qualified. I'm not going to say she wasn't. She was a band six nurse. I think that's like the highest level. But she was younger and she hadn't been working there as long as many of them who were, you know, also qualified just like she was. So many of these senior nurses were like, why is this Lucy Letby chick always in nursery one caring for these babies who are like ICU or HDU, the ones who have the highest needs. Some felt she wasn't experienced enough for that. So like she was qualified, but she hadn't had enough like hands-on experience for that. Or some of them may have felt that Lucy was sort of pushing her way in, you know, like kissing people's asses, being a go-getter, picking up shifts, always being there, always being the face in front of everybody and and kind of like worming her way in and cutting the line. And listen, I don't have a lot of problems with this. I don't like kiss asses. Like if there's something I hate more than anything in the world, it's a kiss ass. But I do appreciate a person who is devoted to their job, who you know, gets there early, leaves late, is always up to take shifts, is always up for new assignments. Like that's showing initiative and you should be rewarded for that. But I will say that Lucy Letby rubs me the wrong way because she's constantly looking for people to feel bad for her about the fact that, you know, some of these other nurses don't like her or talk about her or say negative things about her. She constantly wants people to feel bad for her about everything, about how much she works, about all the babies that crazily die on her shift, about, you know, um, everything, basically. You'll see uh, (laughs) as we go through this. So Lucy messaged a friend saying, quote, I'm still frustrated and upset with what's gone on, but I don't think such rubbish nights and being tired help, end quote. Her colleague and friend that she was talking to uh, responded back, quote, good reply, as it's important to know about the bitchiness, which is all it is. Anyway, you're a star. You've done yourself proud. You've given positive memories to the family, whatever the outcome. Let's hope they can tease her in a few years about her attention-seeking ways, end quote. Okay, so this is what makes me think that people are, like, fed up with Lucy Letby in the same way that Michelle Carter's peers were fed up and annoyed with her because she was so thirsty. So this friend or colleague or both of Lucy Letby's, she's making a joke here. And the joke is stemming back to Baby H because at this point, Lucy's taking care of Baby H. And I guess people are saying, just like I said earlier, that that she wasn't experienced enough to be taking care of all of these high-need babies. And, you know, maybe these babies weren't doing so well (laughs) when they were, like, in her vicinity. So the joke is, hopefully Baby H recovers and 
And in a few years, the biggest problem she'll have is people talking shit about her, right? Like they're doing to Lucy. But this friend and colleague put quotes around attention-seeking ways, which makes me believe that this is exactly what some of the other nurses were saying about Lucy Letby. And honestly, if if even an, a fraction of this is true, they weren't being bitchy. It wasn't bitchiness. It's accurate because that's clearly what she's doing. And honestly, I re- I rephrase that because whether or not she's guilty of murdering these babies or attempting to murder them, I feel like Lucy Letby is definitely guilty of using their trauma to make others give her attention and feel bad for her. Is it crazy to think that she might have made some of these babies crash on purpose so that she could swoop in and save the day, therefore getting more compliments and more people commending her for her hard work and for handling herself so well in stressful situations so that she can look at these nurses and say, oh, you thought I wasn't experienced enough. Well, look how well I've been handling myself in these situations. Now, this is a little theory of mine as I've been going through this. Do I think that Lucy Letby wanted to murder these babies? I don't know. If she is the one responsible for making them sick, I almost wonder if she just wanted to make them sick so that she could be the one to come in and fix them. Like, is that what she was trying to do? And, you know, she didn't mean for the babies who died to die. Like, is that possible? On September 27th, after Baby H's second collapse, Lucy messaged a former nursing colleague saying that the constant collapses of babies around her was wearing on her, like, you know, stressing her out. She said, quote, it's all just so rubbish lately, and it always seems to happen at night when there are less people. Everyone is burnt out, and the unit has been awful, end quote. And Lucy's constantly messaging all sorts of people about Baby H, right? On the night shift between September 26th and 27th, Lucy was the assigned nurse for two babies in room two, while Baby H was the only baby in room one. But even though Lucy wasn't with Baby H, or wasn't supposed to be because she wasn't uh, the baby's assigned nurse, she messaged a coworker at 9.31 p.m. to give an update on Baby H's progress throughout the day. She also messaged Dr. Allison Ventress to say that Baby H had a stable day and that she'd removed the infant's original drain at 8 p.m., telling Dr. Ventress that the tubes had been blocked. And Dr. Ventress responded saying, quote, I've never known a baby to block tubes so often. Glad she's having a stable day, end quote. Now, the weird thing was, Baby H didn't really have a stable day, as Dr. Matthew Neem had to respond to the neonatal unit at 8.49 p.m. when Baby H crashed. Lucy also messaged another coworker saying that she had not been assigned to Baby H, but she'd been helping Shelly, the baby's assigned nurse, so, quote, at least I'm still involved, but haven't got the responsibility, end quote. Now, that's strange because uh, one of you actually messaged or commented something on part one, and I wish I had it in front of me. I screenshotted it. Let me see if it's in my iCloud. My iCloud never works. It's always like, your iCloud's full. So I don't have it on my iCloud because my iCloud never works. But um, basically, this person said, I wonder if Lucy is like warming her way into the medical care of these other babies when they're assigned to different nurses so that she can say like, oh, you know, I wasn't the assigned nurse when this happened. I'm not responsible. This baby wasn't in my care, et cetera, et cetera. And that's very possible. So the messages from Lucy to her friends and colleagues continue. She messaged a friend just before 11 p.m. that she was upset she'd forgotten to record Strictly that night. Strictly is another television show. Lucy went on Facebook around a quarter to one in the morning and 10 minutes later, Baby H's chart shows the baby had a profound desaturation to 40%. So desaturation is also called respiratory desaturation. It's low blood oxygen, and it's known as hypoxemia in medical terms. And, you know, it's, it's really bad. A normal blood oxygen reading, a healthy blood oxygen reading would be between 95 and 100%. And Baby H had a desaturation of 40%, despite equal bilateral entry and a positive capnography. So I had to look this up because I didn't know, but capnography is a monitor. It monitors the concentration or partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the respiratory gases. 
The capnogram is a direct monitor of the inhaled and exhaled concentration or partial pressure of CO2 and an indirect monitor of the CO2 partial pressure in the arterial blood. In healthy individuals, the difference between arterial blood and expired gas CO2 partial pressures is very small. In the presence of most forms of lung disease and some forms of congenital heart disease, the difference between arterial blood and expired gas increases, which can be an indication of new pathology or change in the cardiovascular ventilation system. So what I took from that, I'm not a medical professional, so if you are, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically they didn't see with this um, capnograph any issues that would suggest this had a, a, a source, a secondary source, basically. Like, there were no obvious issues with the cardiovascular or ventilation system. So they didn't understand where this huge drop in the oxygen levels in the blood had come from. And during the trial, the court heard that there was no explanation to be found for such a profound desaturation. Dr. Neem was once again called to baby H's cot around 1 a.m. He began chest compressions as the baby's heart rate dropped dramatically. Baby H was then transferred to Arrow Park Hospital after further desaturation, and while at Arrow Park Hospital, like we said, baby H improved. Now, Lucy messaged her friends telling them how upset she was that baby H's condition had worsened, and Dr. Allison Ventress tried to comfort Lucy, saying, quote, think of all the babies you have saved and who have gone home happily. You're a fab nurse. Hope you manage to get some sleep. End quote. Lucy likes to be complimented. You know, she's, oh, I know we all have a friend like this, but she's the one who's always doing the most and then wants you to tell her that she's doing the most, right? She can't do something just to do it. Like, she can't give to charity just to give to charity. She has to let you know that she gave to charity so that you can say, what a good person you are. What a good person you are. It's like porn to these people. They they love to be told how amazing they are. And I don't know where it stems from exactly. I think it's probably different for different people. But Lucy reminds me of this, as does Michelle Carter, as do many people I know who shall not be named at this moment. <laughs> but their names are going through my head like a billboard. So after being at Arrow Park, Baby H got better within a few days and was sent back to Countess of Chester Hospital on September 30th, 2015. On October 5th, Lucy Letby searched up Baby H's mother on Facebook, as well as two other parents. I believe the parents of Baby A and Baby B. And remember, Baby A and Baby B were Lucy's alleged first victims. They were twin babies. And so she's looking up the parents of these twin babies on Facebook, like constantly, Baby A passed away, Baby B survived. Now, she's doing this all in the space of three minutes at 1.15 a.m. It's almost like it's compulsive, like she has to get her fix in. She's not browsing through the pages. She's not, um, you know, taking her time or genuinely interested. She's like going to one Facebook page, going to the next. And a person made a comment, I wish that I had. I'm going to put him in the video if I have them because I know I screenshot them. But another person wondered in a comment on the last video, is Lucy looking up these parents because she's trying to see if they're talking about her? And I think that that's very possible, right? So she wants to see if she's getting props on their Facebook pages for, you know, being such a great nurse and taking good care of their babies. But I think for baby A and baby B, as time passes, I think she's honestly just like checking up on baby B, the surviving little girl, um, to see like what's going on with the family because that far in advance or that far after um, what happened in their stay at the hospital, these parents really aren't going to be like shouting Lucy let be out randomly on Facebook. So I think that maybe initially that was the case or that's one of the reasons she checks these Facebook pages. So that's a really good theory. But I also do think in a way it's like compulsive. Um, for instance, I have a friend who a couple months ago, well, actually it was like last year, it was it was mid-2022, she was dating, <laughs> this is so stupid, but she was dating two different guys and they didn't know about each other. And then they found out about each other and everyone got in a fight. They both, you know, were like, we're done with you. And now it seems like every day she looks them up on Instagram to see what they're doing. Um, to see if they're dating anybody, just to see if they've posted anything. Just she, And she doesn't really even like do a lot of checking. She doesn't spend a lot of time on their Instagram pages because I've seen her do this. She pulls it up. She checks their story. She checks to see if there's new posts. She's in and out 30 seconds. That's it. Oh, and sometimes she checks to see like comments on their most recent post because she's checking every day to see if like other girls are commenting and stuff. Like 
It's kind of bananas. Her name also shall not be said. So it does remind me of that a little bit compulsive, a little bit like I can't help myself. This is just what I have to do to feel like regulated. Now let's talk about Dr. Allison Ventress, who seems to be a pretty close friend of Lucy's and who also actually cared for baby H during some of the baby's more tough times. Dr. Allison Ventress said that the evening of September 25th had been rough for baby H, and she had noticed a cluster of desaturations in the baby within a two-hour period. She later found that a chest tube in the baby had been placed in a suboptimal position and had basically almost fallen out. So she fixed it and, and everything and went on with her with her day. But later, when Dr. Ventress was called back, she was very concerned concerned because baby H's heart rate had fallen below 100 beats per minute, and there was no obvious reason that this would have happened. Dr. Ventress said, quote, we followed the cardiac arrest protocol and she recovered, but we never found a reason why she got into that state, end quote. Dr. Ventress admitted that desaturations can be common with premature babies who have some medical issues, but she said that cardiac arrests were far less common. In fact, she said they were not at all common, and she said that baby H did didn't really have any health issues besides being born a little bit premature. She was pretty much healthy at birth. Now, Dr. Matthew Neem, who had also responded to baby H during both collapses, he said there was a distinct difference between the two collapses. He said the first collapse, he found secretions in the baby's breathing tube, but the second time, there were no secretions. And he said, quote, the distinction is the lack of clear explanation for the event at this time and the fact that it has happened again in a relatively short space of time, end quote. Baby I was born at Liverpool Women's Hospital on August 7th, 2015, and at the time of birth, she weighed just two pounds and two ounces. Baby I was doing very well when she was born. She didn't get rushed to the NICU, and her mother was allowed to hold her right away. The baby did have to be put on a ventilator for a short time, but once again, this is not uncommon with uh, premature babies or even newborn babies sometimes because their lungs are just, you know, brand new and maybe haven't developed completely yet. But 11 days later on August 18th, baby I was transferred to the Countess of Chester Hospital. So the, the reason that this happens is Liverpool and um, the, the other hospital that I talked about, I forget the name of it, they're both like kind of higher level hospitals and they have more like intensive care available. But when the baby is declared to be better or like doing well or stable, they can be sent on to, you know, other hospitals like Countess of Chester Hospital. But this baby, baby I, would also be sent to a different hospital um, after her stomach became swollen and medical staff at Countess of Chester Hospital thought that baby I might have had NEC. Now remember, NEC stands for necrotizing enterocolitis, which is pretty common in premature infants because the child's digestive system may be immature, allowing dangerous bacteria to grow in parts of the intestine where they usually don't grow, where they don't usually live. So this is actually seen pretty often in premature babies, but even though it's common, it can still be very dangerous. So you do want to diagnose it and treat it ASAP. So baby I was transferred to Liverpool Women's Hospital, which was closer to Elder Hay should she need surgery. And Elder Hay, once again, one of the hospitals that has like more intensive care and can do emergency surgery on premature babies and things like that. Now, Baby Eye's parents were called to that hospital. They rushed in and they were informed that their daughter did not have NEC and she'd actually improved dramatically since being at Liverpool. So she was transferred back to Countess of Chester where Baby Eye was put in the care of Lucy Letby. Baby Eye's mother remembered that soon after they were back at Countess, she was changing her daughter's diaper, and Lucy Letby was there, and Lucy said to the mother, oh, you know, the baby's stomach looks swollen, and she promised to keep an eye on it. Now, the baby's mother was like, it didn't look swollen to me, but she's the nurse, and she said it looks swollen, so it is what it is. Baby Eye's mother then went home once she confirmed her child was doing well, and she'd gotten some, you know, loving and cuddling time in, but that evening, she was called back to the hospital and told that her daughter was sick again, and she walked into the nursery to find medical staff trying to resuscitate the infant, which they were luckily 
able to do. Baby Eye's mother also remembered that out of all the nurses, she believed Lucy Letby was the most reserved. Um, she didn't interact a ton with Lucy, and Lucy kind of like kept to herself. But after this first crash, Lucy did approach the mother of Baby Eye and offered to help this mother bathe her newborn. Um, so there's a lot of like side stories, and I always wonder when I should bring this stuff in because I do want to have a video that discusses you know, fairly Lucy's side of things where she's basically saying like this whole hospital is not, you know, great and the staff is inept and not qualified and there's not enough staffing and things like that. And we're going to get to that. But this mother, Baby Eye's mother, did mention during the trial that like she was kind of annoyed with what was going on at Countess of Chester Hospital because um, some of the nurses were like sick and sniffling and she felt like, you know, her baby was kind of dirty and hadn't been washed. So Lucy was like, would you like me to bring the bath in and then we can give her a bath and, and I'll help you. Baby Eye's mother said, quote, I was so pleased to be able to bathe her. She was obviously enjoying it because she was smiling. Lucy even offered to take some photos with my mobile, which I agreed to, end quote. Uh, mobile is phone. Mobile, I think they call it in the UK. My mobile. Now, the prosecution alleges that Lucy attempted to murder Baby Eye during a September 30th day shift and twice during night shifts in October. And this was described by prosecutor Nick Johnson KC as an extreme example, even by the standards of the overall case. An extreme example, even when you look at what Lucy has done in the past. Johnson told jurors about how resilient Baby Eye was, even after suffering serious collapses. He said each time Lucy let be injected air into that infant's stomach, which is what she's being accused of doing to um, Baby Eye, and that's why they believed that at some point around the time of the first collapse, Baby Eye's stomach was constantly swelling and there didn't seem to be a discernible cause. But Baby Eye kept getting better. Everyone would be encouraged and happy and like, oh, this was just a fluke. And then she would crash again and no one could figure out why. During one overnight shift, the baby had to be resuscitated seven to eight times. So eventually... The parents were told that although their baby was getting better, her heart rate was still low. She was still having these unexplainable collapses. And these parents might want to get their daughter baptized or christened just in case. Now, Baby Eye's parents were confused because she seemed to be doing well. And the mother said, quote, I started to notice that she was looking different. She was looking around the room now, taking it all in. I was able to sit her on my knee. I remember looking at her and thinking, we're going home. She looked like a full-term baby. She didn't look frail or small, end quote. But the parents agreed to the christening anyways, just in case. And after the christening, baby I fell ill again, and she was transferred by ambulance to Arrow Park Hospital. But the doctors there were also confused because they couldn't find anything wrong with her. Baby I arrived at Arrow Park on October 15th and was considered improved enough by October 17th to be sent back to the Countess of Chester Hospital. Just after midnight on October 23rd, 2015, Baby I's mother was woke from a deep sleep to hear that her baby daughter had again taken a turn for the worse and needed to be put on a ventilator again. She and her husband rushed to the hospital to find medical staff, including Lucy Letby, trying to resuscitate baby I as they had been doing for 20 minutes by that point. But they were not successful this time. So... Let's recap, because I feel like there was a lot of information here. On the evening shift from September 29th to the 30th, Lucy was Baby Eye's assigned nurse. Baby Eye collapsed, and an x-ray showed excess air in her gut. On the night shift from October 12th to the 13th, yep, uh, when another collapse happened, Lucy was not Baby Eye's assigned nurse, yet a doctor found Lucy by the baby's cot. And at that time, Baby Eye had a very low respiratory rate, but the alarm hadn't been sounded because the monitor had been switched off for some reason. And when she was asked why she was in Baby Eye's room, Lucy said that she'd been walking by and noticed from the doorway that the baby looked pale. And we have to talk about this because it's very, like, there's sometimes when I'm going through this case and I'm like, I feel bad, like, for just disliking Lucy 
because of who she is and how like needy and thirsty and attention hungry she seems. And maybe I'm biased and maybe my opinion is skewed because I just don't like her. (laughs) Maybe this is all a huge coincidence. Maybe she's not responsible for this. But then something like like this story that I'm about to tell you happens and I'm like, this is so suspicious. Like she's guilty as sin. So Nick Johnson, Casey, the prosecution, he said to the jury, quote, you might also wonder how, standing in the doorway of a darkened room, Lucy Letby could notice that child eye looked pale, end quote. So let's talk about Ashley Hudson said. Ashley Hudson was baby eyes assigned nurse and she testified in court and she actually broke down crying when she explained what had happened the night of that infant's death. She she said that baby I had been very stable. Um, Ashley was with baby I. She did leave the nursery quickly to assist another nurse in the HDU. Uh, there was an emergency. That emergency took about 15 minutes tops. And then Ashley grabbed some expressed breast milk for baby I and headed back to the nursery to feed the baby. Now, all in all, Ashley Hudson was gone for like I don't know, 17 minutes. And when she returned to the room, baby I was in distress. But Ashley didn't know that right away because, first of all, the monitor wasn't plugged in, which is the thing that's going to sound if the vitals drop or they go below a certain, um, I don't know, number. But anyways, she didn't know at first because there wasn't any alarm going off. There wasn't anything like crazy happening. And so she didn't go right over to the baby's cot because she started preparing the breast milk so that she could feed the baby when she approached the cot. Now, at this point, Ashley said that Lucy let be like kind of walked up to the doorway and they were talking and Lucy was in the doorway talking to Ashley. And then all of a sudden, Lucy said, Oh, baby eye looks pale. And Ashley said this was confusing to her because Lucy was five to six feet away. And not only that, the baby was in a cot with a canopy over the cot to cover the baby's face. And this canopy covered the entire upper portion of the cot. Ashley said, quote, the main light for the room was switched off, but the light in the corridor was on. So you were able to do things in the room and have enough light to see where your patients were and where the equipment was, end quote. But she did testify that she did not believe there was enough light to see through a canopy. And there definitely wasn't enough light to determine that a teeny tiny little baby in a cot under that canopy seemed to be looking pale. Ashley Hudson said she was standing closer to the baby than Lucy was, and she couldn't even see that. She said, quote, I couldn't see her. I could see that she was in the cot, but I couldn't see the top half because she was covered by the canopy. I switched the main light on. I pushed back the canopy and realized she was in quite poor condition. At first, she seemed not to be breathing at all, but then she was gasping. Rather than a regular respiratory pattern, it was a one-off, a very deep gasping breath. It was a sound that wouldn't be made by a well baby. Almost a very, very deep breath, but one by itself, not followed by another. I didn't stop to examine her for longer than maybe 20 seconds before we started to intervene. My first thought was that she deteriorated so rapidly that I was too late. The change in her from very shortly prior was remarkable, end quote. So basically, Ashley is saying, I don't understand how this happened. I was here like, what, 16, 17 minutes ago? This baby was completely fine. And now, such a short time later, the baby's like barely breathing, you know, like really crashing and and having trouble. And we have to resuscitate this baby. How did it go from being so great to being so sick? in such a short time. Another x-ray done showed excessive air in the gut of baby eye. Now later, Lucy was asked this by the police um, and they said, how did you see that the baby was pale when you were in the doorway of the room and the light was off? And Lucy said, oh, I think I switched the light on and that's how I saw. But Ashley Hudson was like, no, that didn't happen. I switched the light on. When I walked in there, it was dark. And when Lucy said that she saw the baby looked pale, it was very dim in there. Like even the um, windows have like blinds over them so that it stays dim and the babies can sleep. The next night, the overnight shift from October 13th to the 14th, Lucy was baby eyes assigned nurse and baby eye, surprise, surprise, collapsed again overnight. And then an x-ray showed excessive air in her gut. And at that point, she was transferred to Liverpool where she recovered and was sent back to Countess. And then on the night shift from October 22nd to the 23rd, Lucy was not baby eyes assigned nurse. Yet when the alarm attached to the infant's monitor went off, baby eyes assigned nurse rushed in to find Lucy by baby eyes cot. And then Lucy 
told Baby Eye's nurse, you can go. I've got this. Like, basically, I can't remember exactly what she said, but that's what she said. Like, you don't have to be here. I've got this handled. 90 minutes later, Baby Eye passed away and another x-ray showed excessive air in her gut. Now, the thing that the medical staff who cared for Baby Eye continued to note about her appearance and all these other babies' appearances was a distended abdomen and that her skin appeared mottled in color. The prosecution alleges that each time Baby Eye collapsed or fell ill, it was because Lucy was injecting air into her feeding tube and into her bloodstream. Basically, Every other nurse or doctor who saw baby eye before she began to collapse continually all stated they didn't understand why. She was doing well. You can even see notes that these doctors made saying things like pink, alert, active, handling well, or pink and well profuse with saturation levels above 96% and a soft, non-descended stomach, all of the things that you're supposed to have. But as soon as Lucy arrived on the scene, baby eye would suddenly get sick. But it's what Lucy Letby did after this that raises some eyebrows. After Baby Eye was pronounced dead, the parents were shown into a private room. They were escorted there by two nurses. One of these nurses was Lucy. Once in the room, Lucy asked the parents if they wanted to bathe their daughter one last time. Baby Eye's mother said, quote, I didn't want to look back and regret not doing it, so I said yes. Lucy brought the bath in. She said she could come and take some photos, which we could keep, end quote which is all well and good. Uh, I, I appreciate nurses that go the extra mile. Of course, who doesn't, right? When you're in a hospital or like in a medical situation and if everything feels so clinical and cold, a little compassion goes a hugely long way. But Baby Eye's mother also said, quote, while we were bathing her, Lucy came back in. She was smiling and kept going on about how she was present at the first bath and how Baby Eye had loved it, end quote. And of course, the parents of Baby Eye felt that this behavior was, you know, at the very least, kind of off-key. Their child had literally just died, like, moments before. They were in the process of washing her body, of touching her for the last time. So for Lucy to walk in smiling like a Care Bear ray of sunshine, chattering like it's tea time, you know, seeming happy and being like, oh, I remember the first bath when your child was alive. Remember that when your child was alive? Obviously, the parents had a problem with this. Like, it's not sensitive. That's not compassionate. It's torture. And Baby Eye's mother said, quote, I wished she would just stop talking. Eventually, she realized and stopped. It was not something we wanted to hear. End quote. And it brings me back to previous cases where Lucy was sort of doing the same thing, where she wanted to go into the room with the parents while they were with the body of their child or waiting for their child to take its last breath and like mourning and spending family time together. And she'd go in and like talk to them and bother them to the point where she had to be asked to leave. And when she was like taking pictures of the babies and one of the twins died and she was like, oh, I gave your other twin the stuffed animal from the twin that passed away. And I thought it was so cute when he hugged it that I, I took a picture for you. Like it's kind of – it's kind of like – not it's not sensitive like you have to let the parents take the lead and kind of lead you in this sort of scenario and i think that most nurses know that you're trained to do that um especially in the the neonatal unit but lucy didn't seem to care because once again she needs to insert herself in my opinion and lucy was not done forcing herself on these parents because on november 10th after she finished her night shift and just a few hours before baby eye's funeral lucy snapped a picture of a sympathy card that she had purchased now the pre-printed message on the sympathy card read your loved one will be remembered with many smiles. And Lucy had signed the card, lots of love, Lucy. But on the blank side of the card, Lucy got a little bit more personal. She wrote a, a personal message to the parents of Baby Eye, and it said, quote, There are no words to make this time any easier. It was a real privilege to care for Baby Eye and to get to know you as a family, a family who always put Baby Eye first and did everything possible for her. She will always be a part of your lives, and we will never forget her. Thinking of you today and always, sorry I cannot be there to say goodbye, end quote. Now, at first glance, the, this seems to be like a nice gesture. Like, if you didn't know what Lucy was accused of doing, and you just knew that she was, you know, a neonatal nurse, you'd be like, that's super sweet, right? But it's weird. It's weird that she took a picture of the card, before she sent it. And personally, 
I can only think of two reasons that she would do that. One, she's keeping a picture of the card as some sort of trophy so she can look at it and remember what she did, similar to how she has like medical records from other babies found in her home. Or two, she took a picture of that card so that she could show it to people and say, oh, what a good girl am I? What an amazing and considerate nurse I am. I should be sainted. Mother Teresa ain't got shit on me. But I mean, either scenario doesn't suggest this card being purchased and sent with good or pure intentions. She either did it because she's a sick person who wants to remember her crimes, her alleged crimes, or she did it because she wants attention off the back of an entire family's pain and loss and grief. So uh, column A, column B, door A, door B, lesser of two evils, is there one? I don't know. I suppose the attention getting aspect of it, if that's why she took a picture of the card and that's why she sent the card, would be the lesser of two evils, but still doesn't feel right. Still doesn't feel like something that an emotionally stable person would do. Now, later, Lucy would be asked about this card by the police, and uh, they were like, why'd you send it? And she was like, well, you know, it wasn't something I'd normally do. In fact, this was the only time she had sent a sympathy card to the families of one of her patients. So she didn't really know why she had done it. But she said, no, it's not something I make a habit of and it's not something I do often. Oh, and I forgot to mention that Lucy was looking up a baby eyes parents on Facebook as well, starting with the first search on October 5th at 1.16 a.m. Now, this is before baby eye even passes away. She looked them up again on November 5th. And the 5th of November was actually a busy Facebook day for Lucy because not only did she look up the parents of baby I, but also she went to the Facebook pages um, for the mother of twins, baby E and baby F, as well as the Facebook pages of baby G's parents. And then she searched up the parents of baby I again on May 29th, 2016. This is weird, right? What is she doing this for? And Lucy also messaged her colleagues and her friends about baby eye saying things like baby eye found gaspian cot full resuscitation invented don't know why wasn't nice a whatsapp conversation from october 14th so on the day of the third collapse of baby eye between lucy and one of her co-workers showed that lucy had stated quote i'd like to keep her please basically saying she wanted baby eye to remain in her care and the colleague who i believe was probably the senior nurse who was doing the scheduling for that shift or that day, responded, yes, staying for now, okay to RE keeping. And I think that means like regarding keeping the baby, RE, right? That's what it means. I thought it meant reply, but I think it also can mean regarding. However, less than an hour later, that same colleague messaged Lucy again saying, quote, I've had to reallocate, sorry, end quote. Lucy curious, asked this other nurse, why? Why? Had something happened to the baby? What's going on? And the colleague responded back, quote, no, was just asked to reallocate so no one has her for more than one night at a time or one shift, not just night, end quote. So I think that this means hospital administration was already on to Lucy, or at least on to the fact that whatever was happening to these babies was no coincidence. So they were trying to narrow it down. They were trying to isolate the problem by making sure that no one nurse was constantly in charge of any one baby. That way, if something happened, they could kind of like make a note of that, remember it, and and kind of see if there was a pattern with a specific person, which they ended up doing, right? Because that's what led them to Lucy Letby. So I want to talk about the recollections and testimony of another doctor who had cared for a baby I during her stay at Countess of Chester Hospital. And this doctor's name is actually also Lucy, but I'm going to struggle with the last name because it's Dr. Lucy Bebe. So I don't know. It's B-E-E-B-E. It's either B Bebe, B B B. It can't be B B. Bebe. Or it's like Bebe. Bebe? Is it a bebe? Lucy bebe? I cannot figure it out. And I Googled it to see the pronunciation and I got like four different pronunciations in return. So I think it's bebe. That's what we're going to go with. So Dr. Bebe says, 
that she recalls this specific infant, baby I, because it was unusual that this baby had seemed to be so well and then suddenly so unwell. Dr. Bibe said, quote, in my memory, I felt like she was shipped out to a territory center, made a rapid recovery, and then was brought back very quickly. It certainly stuck in my mind because it had never happened to a baby I'd been involved in the care of before or since at any of the neonatal units I worked at, end quote. So as I had sort of touched on earlier, she refers to a territory center. I hope I'm saying it right, but. Basically, that's referring to, I believe, Liverpool Hospital and that territory, territory, that is the highest Um, level of specialized care within a hospital. So uh, there's like primary, secondary, quatrimary, territory, (laughs) and territory is the highest. And then, you know, other hospitals underneath that are just less equipped to handle certain things. Like I think in the U.S. we call them like trauma one or trauma two hospitals, but it's just different levels of what they're equipped to handle as far as, you know, uh, medical equipment, as far as medical staff, as far as training, things like that. And what Dr. Uh, Bibe is saying is, I don't understand. She was sent to this very high level hospital. They couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. She got better when she was there. Then she came back and she immediately was sick again. Dr. Bibe said that when child I died, she was shocked and frustrated because, quote, I felt there was something else going on with baby I and we were not getting to the bottom of it. I was sad because I remember the family and the whole situation was just very sad and frustrating, end quote. And then Dr. Bibe happened to come across Lucy Letby in another room of the unit, basically venting to a coworker, but like crying venting and just like complaining about how this baby's death was affecting her negatively. Dr. Bibe said, quote, I remember Lucy crying with another nurse, and it was very much the gist of, it's always me when it happens, my babies. It's always happening to me, end quote. And something else the doctors and nurses remembered about baby I was the way she cried when she kept getting sick. Nurse Hudson said that baby I was usually easy to settle. She could be calmed very quickly, and she was typically happy when she was put into her cot or incubator. She wasn't a difficult baby that was impossible to soothe. But the night the baby I died, nothing that had typically worked before was working. Nurse Hudson tried to give the baby some sucrose, which would usually soothe her. She um, gave her like a little, they call it a dummy, but basically it's like something the baby can cuddle with. Um, She repositioned the baby from her stomach to her back. Uh, from her back to her stomach, she patted her back, all of these things that usually worked, but Baby I continued to cry. Nurse Hudson said that she was very familiar with Baby I's normal cry, and this was not normal. The nurse said that this cry was loud, constant, and relentless. It was unlike anything she'd ever heard before. Dr. Sandy Bowen, an expert pediatrician, said this type of crying suggested that the baby was in pain and inconsolable. Dr. Bowen was cross-examined by Lucy's attorney, Ben Myers KC, and he basically asked her, you know, are you just saying this because you're going along with what Dr. Dewey Evans had already concluded? And Dr. Bowen, um, Dr. Sandy Bowen, she'd actually been brought in initially to peer review the findings of Dr. Evans. And Ben Myers said he thought that if the court really wanted Dr. Bowen's independent views, it would have been better if she hadn't seen the numerous reports from Dr. Evans. And Dr. Bowen was a bit offended by this question, which I completely understand because you're basically saying, like, I don't have two brain cells in my head to rub together to have an independent thought that I'm just going to go along with whatever my colleague says because I don't have my own credentials and my own experience. So Ben Myers is like, did you just say what what your colleague said? And Dr. Bone responded, quote, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're saying I've just rubber stamped Dr. Evans' findings, and that is less than discourteous. I was asked whether I agreed with his findings after reviewing the notes myself or whether I found a different cause. I have disagreed with some of his findings and added my own evidence. I'm not backing up what he said said, I'm reviewing the case and coming to my own conclusions, end quote. And it's true, Dr. Bone did disagree with Dr. Evans in some other cases and some other incidences. So I believe that she had the right to be offended. And I believe that she did give her own opinion. It just happened to coincide with Dr. Evans. And both Dr. Evans and Dr. Bone had concluded 
that baby I had suffered from an air embolus purposely administered to her. Ben Myers said that he didn't believe Dr. Bone would have come up with air embolus as a cause if she already hadn't seen Dr. Evans' files. And Dr. Bone was like, nope, wrong again. She told the court that she'd only seen two examples of air embolises in her career. In one of those examples, a bypass machine had been used to help a critically ill baby, and she'd seen air bubbles in the system that had caused an immediate cardiac arrest in the baby. Dr. Bone said that the clinical presentation of an air embolus was wide and varied. And in some cases, the baby might be resuscitated and recover, while in others, the baby might not make it. If a sufficiently large amount of air had been pumped in, it could fill the chamber of the heart, causing the heart to stop. And if the air went through a small hole that's located on the right-hand side of the heart, it could pass to the left side and then be pumped around the body and into the coronary arteries. Dr. Bone said, quote, in this case, I think as well as air being distributed around the body, it's likely the air went in down at the coronary arteries, end quote. So basically, like somebody put air in this baby. This is not an accident. This didn't just naturally occur. This could not have naturally occurred. Moving on to count 13, where Lucy Letby is accused of the attempted murder of baby J on November 27th, 2015. And listen, all of these cases, all of these babies, what what happened to them has been bad and hard to talk about. But if possible, it gets worse. But I think that this video is probably already long enough, and we still do have, I think, seven or eight other babies, including baby J, to discuss. So make sure that you join me for that next video discussing the alleged crimes of nurse Lucy Letby as her trial continues. Now, I am at a place where I'm kind of caught up with the trial after this next video. So I'm just going to kind of like update as the trial goes along and make a video going through each new count and the new allegations and the new testimony of medical professionals and things like that as they happen. So I'll kind of add on to this series. And I am going to as well make an entire video addressing each count and what Ben Myers and Lucy Letby say was the real reason the babies got sick or passed away. Just to be fair and to give her side of the story and, and to see if there is a pattern that indicates somebody else besides Lucy. Because I do think there's a pattern that indicates it was Lucy and implicates her. But if the pattern equally or or just as easily implicates someone else or the hospital, I will be open to um, hearing that, entertaining it, and talking about it. So don't forget to join me for the next video, continuing on discussing the alleged crimes of nurse Lucy Letby, and then there will be videos that follow as we update and as the trial continues. Thank you so much for being here. So there's a couple of things I need you to do before we go. One, I need you to like this video because it helps me. Two, I need you to comment on this video and tell me what you think so far because I really enjoy reading your comments about these cases that we talk about. Three, I need you to subscribe if you haven't already. There's a lot of people watching, but you're not subscribed. So if you can, just subscribe so that you get notified when I post a new video. Also, follow me on Instagram and Twitter. More Instagram than Twitter. I've been away from Twitter lately because it's just toxic, but follow me. My handles are in the description box. Also, follow my podcast, Crime Weekly that I co-host every week with retired police detective Derek Lavasser. We are currently covering the case of Jennifer Kessie, which is an incredibly riveting and interesting case that I've really um, gotten deep into. So check that out right now. You can watch us on YouTube or listen to us wherever you get your audio podcast. And don't forget that I have a coffee company. It's called Criminal Coffee Company. It's delicious, amazing coffee. We have three different roasts. We're adding a decaf soon. We're also adding uh, K-Cups soon. So lots of cool stuff happening. But don't forget to go and check out Criminal Coffee. Get yourself some coffee. We also have the cutest merch that we just dropped last week for Criminal Coffee. Even if you don't like coffee, you will love this merch. It is beautiful merchandise, if I do say so myself. I'm super proud of it. I cannot wait for mine to come. There's this uh, crew neck, like oatmeal colored sweatshirt with the Criminal Coffee like logo and everything. And then there's like the coffee bean fingerprint on the sleeve. I'll put it up on the screen so you can see her. I'll have Nev do it. She's editing my videos now. But it's so cute. It's my favorite thing. I can't wait to get it because it's going to be my favorite new sweatshirt. So thank you guys so much for being here. Everything that I've talked about is in the description box, including a link for Surfshark VPN, links for Crime Weekly, links for Criminal Coffee, links for my social media. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and uh, share the video if you think it's worth sharing. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe, and I'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.
I got blood, blood on the strings 